appreciate the opportunity to be here. Uh, actually, the paper was originally uh, supposed to be given by Oliver Laval. Now, uh, he can't be here, uh, but uh, the good thing, I'm working for him, so he sent me. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm located much closer because I'm located in Germany, uh, Wiesbaden, so it was not too far to get here. I've been working in the UV disinfection industry for some 12 years, um, mainly in municipal water and, and wastewater treatment systems. Um, but just last year I joined uh, Aquionics mainly because of the new source of light, uh, namely uh, UV LED. So I'm going, uh, going to shed some light on the UV sources and possible applications. So regarding the UV disinfection, uh, we pointed out a few things which uh, has driven the UV technology and its development and applications. And there uh, are some drivers like uh, chemical resistant pathogen barriers. So you may have heard about cryptosporidium, uh, waterborne uh, organism that uh, is um, even uh, effective chlorinations in place can survive that treatment process and, and still uh, result in severe illness. Um, another factor was, uh, since we are not using any chemicals, there's no byproducts formed that could be cancerous. Uh, so chemical-free treatment um, with some oxidation properties, and compared to other solutions, it uh, is also cost competitive. On the flip side, um, we do have a wavelength compromise, so to speak, and I will explain what I mean with that. We have some architectural constraints because all the lens uh, tend to be cylindrical and rather long. So we basically uh, design the unit around the consumable of the product, which is really a little bit weird concept. Another uh, flip side we have heard about that before is the mercury that is uh, uh, in the lamp. The start time in terms of um, warm-up time and also cooling down. So you cannot just switch on and off uh, without compromising the lamp light. And, and then, again, compared to whatever, it could be quite costly, depending uh, also on the availability of, uh, of the consumables. <coughs> so the question came up about alternative solutions. And we have heard about uh, solar disinfection today quite a lot. Um, filtration is obviously also um, an option. Uh, there's other types of lamps, like in the bottom. Um, however, we, we uh, selected UVC LEDs uh, as a solution. And history of the LED, from my experience, I think in 2003, uh, the first prototype has been presented uh, with an internal um, event at, at Vedico, today Xylem. And it was a, a LED which was $600 in, in cost, and the lamp lifetime was 20 hours, and it could treat three drops of water. So everybody said, okay, that's probably 10 years out. Now we're 11 years later, and things have changed quite a bit. So if we uh, look at the uh, properties of LEDs, they are mechanically robust. So if you drop an LED, it will not uh, break. Um, you could probably even step on it or drive uh, over it with your car. It will probably still be okay. Um, I would not recommend that, though. Um, the, the footprint, uh, since it's a point source of light, it, it allows you a complete different approach regarding product design and reactor design uh, because it's not predetermined by, by the uh, geometrical shape of that light source. Also, the wavelength, in a sense, is tunable. So we can engineer various wavelengths depending on the needs. Uh, it is mercury free and it's instant on off. So without compromising the lifetime, you can switch it on and off as many times as you want. The warm up time technically is nine nanoseconds and then it's at 100% uh, output. So compared to several minutes uh, or with very cold water, it could be up to 10 minutes warm up time for a traditional lamp uh, that allows particular, uh, well, any batch processes where you have flow on, off, so you could uh, match that with uh, switching on and off the LED at the same time. So in a nutshell, and I know we have some experts in the audience here, but uh, bear with me for a moment. Uh, we, the LEDs are made of wafers of about two inches size, and this 
specialist that cut about 40,000 LEDs out of this uh, little plate and qualify them regarding the intensity, regarding uh, the wavelength, uh, and you can, this process is called binning, so you can get different qualities um, of LED. Um, to make them usable, they are applied to an SMB package, which allows them to control them electronically and control the thermal <coughs> conditions of, of that component. So that's basically where, where I probably would take it from there, so I leave it to others how to make them, but they're very uh, effective. In terms of um, the wavelength, um, we heard you hear a lot about 254 nanometers, which is basically the, the peak emittance of mercury-based lamps. But uh, as a matter of fact, the peak absorbance of the DNA, so the most effective wavelength for disinfection, is at 263. But that's not so easy to produce. So that's everything seems to be standardized on 254 by now, and uh, and. That, it's well established, so we can't ignore this, but reality is 263 would be better, would be more efficient. So with uh, other advantages over uh, mercury-based lamps, we have no risk of damaging or breaking the lamp, as I pointed out before. So a mercury spill kit, uh, as it's found today in, with every water treatment work, is not necessary anymore. And the power consumption for uh, individual LEDs is very low, so that you can charge them with, with uh, your phone charger if you have the right connection to it. So the, the lamps are operated on 6 to 30 volts DC. Uh, so the, the operation uh, with solar power or battery power is, is a realistic option with LEDs. So some uh, instant on-off point of use applications, so that's basically uh, some perfect examples where you have a system that is sitting there for 23 hours a day and only used for one hour. A conventional system needs to be operated continuously, so you would have to operate it 24-7. Um, with the LED, you, you'd switch it on when you need it. So basically, if you want to uh, drink a glass of water, the water will be treated in the moment you press that button. And the water is flowing through the tube, through the UV system that is in included then maybe in a water tap, maybe in a coffee machine, or even an appliance uh, like fridges with an ice maker on it or a water dispenser, it could be included. So not warm up, no warm up, this, this is obviously not for those conventional lamps, you would always have to wait a couple of minutes before you can uh, expect the water to be safe. Also the mercury, I think, uh, I agree with the comment that was made before. It's only a very small percentage uh, of UV lamps in the in the trash that create a, a mercury problem. Uh, on the other hand, it, it would be avoidable, um, and I think that is always at the benefit. So you would not need any special handling, and the recycling would not be an issue. Uh, and I'm not sure if we send mercury-based lamps around the world if they will all be found in recycling later on, or not just on the regular. Uh, in the regular trash. So uh, some handling would be certainly easier. There was some work done comparing um, the effectiveness of, of the uh, UV light emitted by LEDs versus low pressure mercury based lamps. The left uh, graph shows uh, some, long, uh, some inactivation of T1. The right one is MS2. Those are surrogate organisms that are used in validation of UV disinfection systems. And, and you can barely see that based on a delivered dose uh, on the horizontal act, uh, uh, it will result in a certain lock inactivation and uh, the, the beam, polybell beam the results basically show that uh, they're both equivalent. So technically, it doesn't matter uh, to the bug if it's killed by uh, photons emitted by uh, LED or by a mercury-based lamp. Uh, I guess you can agree with that. Now, some people say, oh, when will you take over the conventional lamp uh, industry? Probably um, that's, that's the main question. Okay, can we replace this long tube with a lot of LEDs lined up in a cylindrical way? Um, Bailey, that's not our intention, and I don't think, or we don't think it will uh, be very efficient either. And there's a few reasons for that. 
if you think about an LED, that's just an electronic component. If you think about a water treatment system, its uh, performance will be depending on more than just the light source. So obviously we have, uh, now this comes into play here, we have um, the LED power efficiency, so how much of the electricity will be converted in the desired wavelength, and low pressure, high intensity lamps, uh, based on mercury, seem to be uh, at 38 to 40 percent, and that is also maybe not quite, but probably 95 percent of what's possible. Maybe we see another point to be gained in the next years to come, but that's basically it. Uh, it's a little bit small here, but if you look at the magenta line, uh, this has 8 percent. That's basically where we are today with LEDs. So that's, uh, let's see. Um, however, if we, if we look at the development of other wavelength LEDs, such as a red one, here's the first one, uh, they started also in the single digit efficiency range and they're now nearly at 90 uh, percent efficiency. As similar to the blue line, which was probably developed uh, the latest. And we, we may expect maybe not as high efficiencies as with those wavelengths, but probably 60, 60 plus percent uh, is something which, which could be achieved in the next 10, 15 years. I don't know. Depends a little bit how much resource will be put behind. The other thing is very important that the thermal management, um, due to the inefficiency, there's a lot of heat created, not on the side that is radiating uh, uh, the, the light into the water, so the medium will not be warmed up, but on the, on the back side, the electronic will warm up, so you need to get rid of that heat and manage that LED from a thermal point of view to ensure lifetime uh, is achieved. Um, obviously, the reactor design um, on the left bottom, that's very important, and due to the different geometry, that will be different from a traditional PV system. Um, yeah, I, I would probably say the, the main uh, disadvantage at this point is cost. So it's pretty complex to manufacture those LEDs. Uh, still a lot of R&D work being done as we speak. And however, looking back from the 2003 example of that one LED with 20 hours lifetime and $600 in cost, we have probably already came a long way. And uh, we would, uh, Carl pointed out that our unit is probably $10,000. I can uh, calm you down. It's only 5000 now. And it may be only half of that in a year from now. So we already see the impact of LEDs becoming more and easier available. There's maybe different or more suppliers. Quality is going up. Uh, and we expect, uh, down the road, we expect lower prices. And that will also impact the product availability and the, the application. Today, that's where we are today, um, we have uh, the output here, and you probably have to get used to microwatts here for this, and milliwatts instead of watts and kilowatts. Uh, but depending on the lamp power and the wavelength, we have different areas of application. Uh, with low output, we can already um, um, allow analy analytical instrumentation to work. With uh, lamp powers in the 10 plus milliwatt per centimeter square range, we can do water treatment and we can air and surface uh, treatment. So in terms of products, uh, we have seen the Pearl Aqua before uh, in, in Carl's presentation. That, that's basically what we have presented as a working water treatment product. More to s sought to be a product development platform, not a mass product as it's today. But certainly, uh, we are in discussion with several companies and, and uh, interested uh, parties to include this technology in some other equipment. The Pearl Arrow is a little bit, probably not the right spot to talk about that uh, too much, but we barely employ the LEDs, make them um, air-cooled, and apply them to uh, applications in, in air and surface treatment. Um, the Pearl Sense then is using a 254 nanometer wavelength LED to measure UV transmitter as an analytical instrumentation, and we may see more analytical instruments uh, in the future. So just a uh, little repeat, the transmitter was already mentioned by Michael this morning. Um, if we s 
we say transmittance, again, that's uh, basically the, this wavelength of 254 nanometers and how much of it can uh, travel through, penetrate the water in a layer of one centimeter. So in this example, if we have uh, after 10, cent, uh, 10 millimeters, we have 90%, and obviously uh, it, it gets less and less. So after 50 millimeters, we only have 60% left. That is important if you design the uh, UV disinfection system. So that will determine the distance between the, la the lamps. A clean water system may have a wide distance between the lamps. A wastewater system with lower quality needs uh, a more narrow arrangement of the lamps. So to design a system, to select the correct system for a certain application, we need to know the UV transmittance. As we have heard this morning, that parameter fluctuates over the years, the seasonal influence, etc., with surface water is pretty strong. So ideally, you may want to, if you, as a water works um, operator, you want to know uh, an entire year to really capture all the extreme values and make sure you select the right design UVT. Um, so the, the resulting product, and I also, also have one on display um, in, the, in the hallway, uh, it's basically this per cent C. So it's using one LED. It still expenses that LED, but we only need one, so it's okay. It's a competitively priced product, and it's measuring the, uh, the UVT. You can see here is a one centimeter gap. So we basically measure uh, the path length of 10 millimeters, and we can uh, measure anything in the range of 10 to 100 percent UVT, which then allows uh, either to design a system or also to operate a system. Um, and uh, basically optimize power. Depending on the testing protocol, you, you would, uh, the system would be able to use that information and dim down or ramp up the lamp power so you optimize your operation in terms of power consumption and still make sure that you always apply enough UV to uh, do a proper disinfection job. Then the Pearl Aqua, um, it has been uh, tested um, not officially validated, but quantified uh, up to about um, 10 liters per minute. And there was one testing done uh, at 60 millijoule dose, so a little bit above uh, regular values, at 0.5 gallons per minute, and which probably is outstanding, is a 50 milliwatt optical power required to achieve that. And that has to do with the other uh, uh, factors I just mentioned, like reactor design, material selection, and things like that. So this unit has been sold mainly to R&D institutes and in uh, R&D departments of companies that may want to include this into medical equipment, for instance, into uh, water treatment in aircraft, uh, things like that. Things where the benefits outweigh the disadvantage of a higher price today. So that's uh, an interesting field, and we, we expect a lot of uh, things happening there in the next couple of, couple of years. Potential application could be domestic water. We heard about that before. Many people do not really trust the uh, city water coming through the pipes, so could, could uh, end up with some additional treatment device on the countertop here or underneath. Um, there are solar-powered solutions available. Um, this one uh, is an example uh, of Solar Spring. So they have uh, a UV system employed here. Since they are also bringing this equipment in remote areas, and unfortunately many times the lamp breaks or let breaks during handling. So if, if it was equal in price, it would be no brainer to replace this with an LED. Of course, we're talking about uh, flow rates in the arena up to 10 liters per minute. So from my point of view today, this is not competing with traditional UV systems, really. In terms of the majority of the systems, uh, they're way, way above that flow range. So uh, the main three takeaways. Um, we have some advantage due to the lamp technology. No mercury, instant on-off. They're very robust, uh, allow a flexible architecture, selectable wavelengths. Um, or I should mention that in our disinfection unit, we are using 275 nanometer LEDs. Um, 
and they are also in the uh, germicidal range, so they're um, basically as effective as 254. This 263 being kind of in the middle, uh, I think that, that can be appreciated. And there's further um, R&D work to come um, based on a collimated beam device that we have provided. Secondly, we have a different challenge. So it's, we have a lot to, do, to work on the LED itself. Uh, there's specialists working on that. We, we deal with the optics, uh, the fluid dynamics, the hydraulics, um, but also the thermal management of the LED, which really determines the lifetime of the, of the LED, and also how to control, how to sense this. There's uh, sensors available uh, as an option. So in, in technically, it's all feasible. Um, commercially, it's, it's still challenging, I would think. So to achieve acceptable mechanical costs, there's still some work to be done. But uh, on the other hand, there are some products, application doable. I, I really want to point out the uh, UVT measurement again, because that's something we are marketing for a year now. So and there are some 200 units being sold into the market, and uh, especially the handheld unit, which does not require any warm-up time, provides a, a nice benefit to the service technicians that usually have to wait 50 minutes because before they can take a measurement. And here it's basically after a minute they can pack the unit again. So that's a pretty obvious advantage. And um, if you're interested, we have also some units available for testing. So just speak to me. And with that, uh, I'm happy to take some questions. on LEDs or systems? Yeah, today we, we expect 2,000 hours of lamp light. Yeah. Now with the measurement, I have to point out that it's not operated continuously. We only operate the lamp three seconds per minute, which gives us a lifetime of four and a half years, approximately. At, with, the, yeah, with the continuous measurement. With the handheld, it's barely two million readings. So it's probably the last UVT measurement device you would buy in your life, <laughs> I guess. What is the, the variation in the, in the uh, I'm not 100% sure. It's probably in the 75 to 80 percent range. But our, the measurement concept is al always comparing the actual measurement. So if you calibrate it, you always set it back to 100% that the absolute intensity does not really matter for your measurement. Um, we know from experience that uh, cold water and uh, heated up electronics can sometimes be more, uh, a problem, especially with condensation. Um, is condensation a problem for electronic parts, like the ceiling of the LED? No, no, I mean, you can encapsulate them in, in different ways. I mean, you have to get rid of the cooling and the standard is a is a mainly a fan cooled device. So obviously that is uh, could be sensitive. You would may have a heater. So it's, it depends really on the application. But <coughs> I think it's uh, there's a solution available for that. In terms of the water temperature, uh, I would also like to highlight that the LED is working better if the water is colder. So just the other way around than with typical uh, with conventional. So as far as uh, I think there's one more. Oh, one more. Yeah. Well, that is more general comment to the UV disinfections. Um, <laughs> I'm not here to tell you the complete truth <laughs> for sure. <laughs> but uh, I, I guess that's. Uh, it's kind of agreed in the industry, if you don't add chemicals, uh, that you have no byproduct by that chemical that you would add. <laughs> it's, there's no chlorinated <laughs> compounds, obviously, yeah. no trial methods, but there are potential for some byproducts. But typically the most likely byproduct would be nitrite formation if you have nitrate in the water, if you have a medium pressure source. But that won't happen with low pressure because the wavelength of the low pressure doesn't photolyze nitrate. 
but low, low wavelengths does photolyze nitrate. So you might have some formation of nitrite. That's one potential byproduct of medium pressure systems only, not low pressure. The other potential is trans any transformations of organic matter have the potential to have some type of byproduct, but to date there's been no evidence of any, you know, um, formation of any products that have, have any toxicological significance that anyone's found, but that's not to say it couldn't happen. The doses that used for UV are fairly low for disinfection. It's such a targeted process. It's so efficient directly against the nucleic acids that, you know, you don't have a lot of other photoactivity at those doses. If you went to thousands of millijoules, then you, you might see some more transformations of, of background water matrix. But certainly there's no chlorinated byproducts, no trihalomethanes, no regulated byproducts that, that are of concern. Well, actually, the, 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 the LED is, is uh, protected by a quartz glass window. It's not in direct contact with the water. Well, you, it depends a little bit on the manufacturing. I mean, you could probably provide a LED package, including some kind of uh, coating or a, like a Teflon layer. It's always a compromise to not reduce the transmittance or transmissivity of that layer. So quartz glass, it seems to be well established, uh, but you could probably integrate it also into the manufacturing if you had a critical mass to, to achieve, because that's the main caveat today. We can think of a lot of nice products, but we still have to find somebody to pay for it. So that's my, my challenge, actually. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks a lot, Matthias. All right. Thank so. you.